Today we're going to talk about emphasis and shape. So to get started, we're going to look at emphasis. So a synonym for emphasis is focal point. Um, focal point is a compositional device emphasizing a certain area or object to draw attention to the piece and to encourage closer scrutiny of the work. So the example I have over here is Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. Uh, this takes place in the Salt Flats out in Utah, and this is a land art piece. Um, so in this piece, the artist got tons of rocks and placed them out in this kind of spiral form that jets out very far into the river. And it is, looks kind of, you know, the spiral kind of looks a little bit of a natural or organic shape, but it's so distinctive and different from the landscape around it that it really draws attention um, to itself and is, it really creates a, a focal point within the landscape. Emphasis by contrast. So this is Wheat Field, A Confrontation by Agnes Dennis. And this is a piece that took place in 1982, in the summer of 1982 in New York City. And what the artist did was um, she had an area of land kind of, um, right near the coast or in like a shipping yard area in New York City. And she planted a whole bunch of wheat. And over the course of the summer, that wheat grew and created this giant field. And she actually harvested that wheat and brought it all around the country and in an exhibition and talked a lot about um, industry and growth and how our food is a part of that. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis that she created on this wheat um, and its growth, but also, I mean, just visually, I mean, you can look at that wheat in contrast to the gray size skyscrapers behind it, and it is just so dramatically different. Um, I've heard stories about how during that summer, everyone was talking about it, um, non-art people trying to figure out what was going on because it was such um, a visually drawing thing. So emphasis by contrast, this natural space in this very urban environment. Emphasis by Isolation. So this is a piece by Felix Gonzalez Torres called Untitled Portrait of Dad. Um, so Felix Gonzalez Torres did several of these candy pieces and um, the artist, a little bit of background on him is kind of important. Um, so the artist um, was a gay man who died of AIDS. He made work in the 1980s and 90s knowing that he had AIDS and was coming towards the end of his life. Um, so a lot of his work has to deal with his own demise and um, leaving behind some sort of legacy or space for himself. So these candy pieces are their tributes to a lot of really specific people and the way that they work is actually the weight of the candy is the um, weight of the person's body when they died. Um, so when you walk up, the first time I encountered one of these pieces, I saw it in the corner of a room and it was actually a very colorful piece of candy pile and I didn't know what it was and I was kind of staring at it like, what is that? That Why is that candy on the floor? Did someone drop that? I don't understand, you know? And then I saw someone come up and take a, a piece of candy and I was shocked and, and then I did myself and it just felt like this you know, you just couldn't look away because you couldn't figure it out. It was just all alone on the floor in the corner of a very fancy gallery. Um, and so it was kind of this sadness because everyone's taking away the weight and mass of this person's body, but they're also taking it with them and that kind of sweet, sugary um, kind of lovingness and, and pure, you know, joyfulness of that person's life gets to go with them too. So um, about loss and um, and what the benefits of it can be as well. But isolation, we really... I. You know, you really notice these pieces by the fact that they're always alone on the floor. Emphasis by placement. So this is a piece called House by Rachel White Reed. Um, it was made in 1993. So this is a concrete cast of the interior of a condemned house in London. So this was kind of from a tenement, low-income area. Rachel White Reed found this house in what was... Um, you know, lots of urban areas go through a series of gentrification and London was no doubt a part of that as well. And so this area was being turned over into a more high income area after being more low income. And so what she did was she came into this house that was going to be torn down anyways, and she sprayed concrete on the inside of it and then took away the house on the outside. So what was left was a cast of the interior of this apartment. And so the reason why I showed this one is because the placement of it in this neighborhood where it really lived, this house really existed, is so important. Um, if this piece had been in a gallery, it would have been good, but not as good as having it be in the location of really where this house stood and bringing about all these questions of a place that feel, you know, home that kind of feeling of being inside your house, of all the stories that happen there and the memories that those walls have being made solid um, before the entire neighborhood is being destroyed is, is kind of um, kind of amazing. 
All right, another piece that's actually about home. So this was um, a piece made by Doho Su, who is a um, immigrant artist in the United States. He tra he was not born here, but he, he lived most of his life in another country. And when he came here, he um, really kind of missed his old home, his family, his friends, the place where he grew up. And so he started kind of making these fabric pieces that re, um, recreated, a, it's a life-size recreation of his old apartment. And so emphasizing the whole over the parts, this kind of blue, see-through, dreamy fabric, it, it kind of gets us the feeling of the apartment and it's actually an exact replica without being a specific part of it. So there's no specific paintings on the wall or we don't know what color the fireplace was or we don't know how dirty the toilet was or anything like that or there's nothing really in the fridge. It's just the feeling of being in there. So this kind of emphasizing the whole over a specific part of the apartment. It gives us the idea of the apartment without actually being any specific nature. All right, now we're gonna move into shape. So shape is a visually perceived area created either by an enclosing line or by color and value changes defined, defining the outer edges. Um, form um, is referring to objects, so it is the shape and structure of a thing. So shape is often considered a two-dimensional word and form is often considered a three-dimensional worm, but we're going to kind of use both of them and think about them in both ways. So this is a piece called how Will I Know by Corinna Ray, and just this really funky, silly shape just hanging out in the world by itself. All right, naturalism, idealism, or distortion. So naturalism is a skillful representation of the visual images, forms, and proportions as seen in nature with the illusion of volume and three-dimensional space. So on the right, we see an image by George Siegel. This is a sculpture called The Dancers. Um, and so the way that these, these pieces were made was George Siegel would actually bring in models, live models, um, to his studio, and he would have them kind of strike a pose, and then he would cast them with plaster bandages, which is kind of similar to the materials used to like cast, to make a cast of someone's arm or something like that if they broke their arm. So it's these bandages that you wrap around the person and they just take a, an exact replica of, of that person's body and fit and form to it. And so these are kind of really fleshy and chunky and sloppy looking, but they're actually exactly at the, as these bodies were. And in that shape, they show kind of the real nature of what these people looked like. All right, in contrast, we have idealism. Idealism is an artistic theory in which the world is not represented as it is, but as it should be. All flaws, accidents, and incongruities in the natural world are corrected. So this is a very famous sculpture called The David by Michelangelo. And um, the reason why I chose this piece is because I want to talk about the fact that idealism and naturalism often get confused. So lots of times in artwork or in our world, um, objects and images and people are portrayed as being natural, but they're actually idealistic. So the David is a good example of something that's supposed to be this kind of rendering of a human body, but it's really not as the human body is, but as the artist wants them to be. It's this idealized human body. So I remember the first time I saw this in an art history class, my, um, the professor said, look at the hands and pointed out the hands to me because I was like, oh, beautiful. you know. But when you look at the hands, you realize that the hands are much larger than the head, which has nothing to do with the proportions of the human body. It's just a way to create power and control in those hands and really kind of brought, draw our attention to them and, and give this person power by doing that. Um, so again, idealistic representation, not naturalistic. All right, finally, we have distortion. So distortions, a departure from an accepted perception of form or object. So distortion often manipulates established proportional standards. So this piece called Beyond the River by Huma Bahaba. Um, so this piece, we see cork, we see wood, we see foam, and we, it kind of looks like a totem pole almost. I, I see kind of an animal, I see a, a machine, I see a person, I see kind of all these different types of you know, figures that you can possibly bring together, the proportions are off. I mean, it, it's it's kind of very striking and strong looking, but also I don't know how this person, you know, would even walk or where they're from. Um, so again, a lot of distortion to create kind of this new being or this new person. All right, so the distortion is a form of expression. So this is a piece called After the Fire is Gone by Kate 
Giordano. So these are actually images that I took from this installation. It was a, a room full of people. These are just a couple detail shots. Um, and the way that they were made is really interesting. So it's a lot of paper mache and cardboard and you can see glue and tape and, and they're just really kind of crusty and you know, it feels like everything's really quickly made, but it gives us this feeling of this place. You know, these people are maybe, hey, they live in a trailer and there's dirt on the floor and, and, um, I don't know. They just felt like there was a very human space. It was well, well used, well loved, well lived. Um, it really gave a feeling of what these people's lives might've been like, um, and who they were based on how the distortions of their their world was was made. So the distortion is a form of expression. It tells us more about them than if they were just a naturalistic and accurate representation. Um, it's a way of telling us information that might have not been there. So again, not just um, creating a kind of alternative reality, but telling us more about the reality that that is here. So distortion is a form of expression. Another type of artistic distortion is abstraction. So a visual representation that may have little resemblance to the real world. Abstraction can occur through a process of simplification or distortion in an attempt to communicate an essential aspect of form and concept. So this is a piece by Alexander Calder called Black Beast. And in this piece, we kind of, I mean, I see a couple different things. I see a bat, I see a wolf, I see a web, I see, I see all these different things, but no one thing in particular and very simplified form, very distorted. I mean, I can almost flip this upside down and, and look at it a different way. It's, you know, it's just its own thing. Okay, different types of abstract forms. So this is a biomorphic form. Biomorphic describes shapes derived from organic or natural materials. Um, so we have a picture of the piece called Cloud Gate by Anish Kapoor. This piece is an outdoor um, sculpture. It lives in Millennium Park, which is a huge art park and outdoor park in Chicago, in the downtown Chicago area. And tons of people walk past it every single day. And so it's this very reflective surface. You can walk under it and around it. You can see all of the skyscapers around you and the people walking around you. And it's just this very engaging sculpture. But it it's also known in loving terms as the bean. Most people call it the bean. So it just really feels like this smooth little seed, bean, something like that. And even though it kind of has this futuristic shine to it, the shape itself is very organic and natural. Pure forms. So another type of form is non-objective. So a type of artwork with absolutely no reference to or representation of the natural world. The artwork is the reality. So this is kind of a wild piece. This is a piece by friends, Fred Sandback. It's called Untitled Triangle with a Broken Leg. And if you cannot see anything in the image, you are looking at it. It is a very hard to see piece. So if you can see, there's a triangle shape very thinly outlined right in the middle. So Fred Sandback makes a lot of pieces out of string where he'll draw these kind of large shapes in wide open minimalist rooms. And the way that I encountered it the first time was I almost walked into it. You can barely see them. Um, and so what happens when you finally do see them, you, you almost knock into it, you know, you're walking up and then all of a sudden the lights hits it maybe and you can see it and you see this form and there is an interior and an exterior and you just start making up this imaginary sculpture in your mind. You start seeing the edges of it and the sides of it when really you're just looking at negative space, you know, just the room around you, but you're dividing it up into this big sculpture you see. So it's really this thing that happens in your mind. Um, and it's just this, its own experience unto itself. So it doesn't reference anything else. Um, it's just, it's its own thing. All right, different types of shapes we can have. So um, we can have curved linear. Curved linear means rounded and curving forms that tend to imply flowing shapes and compositions. So we have a piece here called Repetition 19.3 by Eva Hess. Um, she made work in the 60s, um, and it, she used a lot of industrial materials, so tubes and resins and, and polymers and, and different types of things like that, but they all kind of very intimately referenced the body in this strange way. So she was using these forms that feel kind of industrial and shouldn't, but the way that they slump and sag. I mean, I really see a group of people kind of milling about and chatting or something like that in a group. You can kind of feel their bodies slouching. Um, so that rounded and curving form really implies 
kind of movement in people and bodies. Um, so curvilinear, I think, right? The alternative to that is rectilinear. So rectilinear are shapes composed of straight lines. So we see a piece here by Donald Judd called 15 Untitled Works in Concrete. And so this is a piece that lives outside in Marfa, Texas in a very kind of desolate area. And the way that you encounter it is you walk up to it and there's nothing else around. And you just have these giant kind of open shapes and you can walk in them and around them and through them and as you walk through them the landscape around you is kind of framed by the open spaces that these shapes create so these rectilinear lines and shapes really kind of create a way of viewing the natural world around you they kind of divide up the landscape they let you see through it in a new way they create these little compositions